Welcome to the 2021 Ocean Vision Summit. More than 2,000 scientists and other ocean aficionados have registered from 80 countries around the world. This is our opening session. We ask that during this session, you mute your microphones and turn your video off. Speakers will be shown in spotlight on the screen. If you have questions for the speaker, please put them in the chat with the word question to start. The panel will be answering questions, so there may not be time to take any from the from the audience. Starting off the Ocean Visit Summit today is the Executive Director of Ocean Visions, Brad Ack. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the opening session of the Ocean Visions 2021 Summit towards a global ecosystem for ocean solutions. My name is Brad Ack. I'm the Executive Director of Ocean Visions, and it's a great pleasure, truly, to commence this week of fabulous programming and discussions with a truly global community of solvers, people dedicated to solutions, scientists, engineers, innovators, technologists, and big thinkers from across the globe. Thank you all for being here. Our purpose here this morning is to kick off this event uh, and provide you a little bit of context on ocean visions and what we are aspiring to do together. I'm joined by some of our esteemed members and partners. Before I turn to them, let me just give you a brief overview of Ocean Visions. Our mission really is to mobilize a diverse community of problem solvers to work together to tackle the most pressing challenges facing the ocean, which are numerous. Our growing network is fostering collaboration across different sectors between some of the leading oceanographic and, and academic institutions in the United States and a variety of civil sector partners. We're also expanding our reach uh, internationally. We work together to identify, develop, test, and ultimately where appropriate to scale solutions. And we particularly recognize that commercialization of solutions often provides the quickest pathway to scale and to spread. And so we're particularly interested in supporting innovators and inventors from within and without academia to connect with the right partners within and without academia with the appropriate skill sets to take ideas from the drawing board all the way to the arena of impact. Now I want to turn to our panelists uh, representing some of the Ocean Visions member organizations and partners and I'm going to introduce them uh, one by one and ask them just to speak a little bit about why they joined Ocean Visions, how the mission and vision of Ocean Visions aligns with their institutional priorities, and how Ocean Visions and we together can advance solutions. And first, I'm going to start with Margaret Leinen, who is a paleo-oceanographer and paleoclimatologist, but she also is the director of Scripps Institute of Oceanography and our virtual host for uh, the summit and the Dean of the School of Marine Sciences at UCSD. So, uh, Margaret, please um, uh, come forward and I'd love to hear your thoughts on those questions. Sure, thanks, Brad. Uh, it's wonderful to join you and congratulations on this first Ocean Vision Summit. Uh, it's wonderful to see it and just fantastic to see so many uh, who have registered for the, uh, these great sessions. So uh, Scripps Institution of Oceanography has joined Ocean Visions uh, because of the focus on solutions and the intersection between research, uh, the private sector, government, nonprofits, advocacy, all of the groups that have to come together uh, to really uh, ensure that we have solutions and that those are appropriate. And I think that uh, you know, especially during the last uh, 15 to 20 years, uh, we've really, in ocean science, expanded our view beyond uh, exploration and discovery to include finding solutions, and that it's, it's uh, really important for us. And at Scripps, we find that our students are passionate about this topic. They, it's their world for the, that, they're, that we're building. It's uh, it's their future and they want to see the solutions in place. And so uh, on behalf of them, on behalf of 
the field of ocean science and really solutions for the world, uh, we joined this effort. Thank you so much. I want to uh, next Aaron uh, Satterwit, who is a marine ecologist who's focused on understanding the effects of climate variability and change on marine ecosystems and coastal communities. She is also the program coordinator for the California Cooperative Oceanic Fisheries Investigations. Um, and she is one of the co-founders of the Early Career Ocean Professionals who are very actively engaged in the summit. So welcome, Aaron. I'd love to hear your thoughts on how Ocean Visions uh, fits into all of the things that you're interested in doing. Uh, thanks so much, Brad. Really appreciate it. Um, yeah, and thanks for having me. This is really a treat. And so as Brad mentioned, I'm Erin Satterthwaite and researcher, extension specialist, and program coordinator with California Sea Grant at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, where I'm working to link the information from the long-term ocean observations to researchers and practitioners to work toward the sustainable use and broader celebration of marine ecosystems, especially in the face of climate change. And I also helped to develop the Early Career Ocean Professional Program, which aims to promote the inclusion of diverse voices of the next generation of ocean leaders in international policy processes. And I tend to think of design as the core of sustainability, since design is the process of envisioning and really participating in the creation of our collective future. And so I was really drawn to Ocean Visions and the Global Ecosystem for Ocean Solutions because of the forward-looking, solutions-oriented, and diverse community that I was really excited to find. And I really feel like this community for me has provided a place to co-develop a shared vision and work toward that future together by really building these inclusive and effective processes. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what we can do together in this community. So thanks for having me and I'm looking forward to our discussion today. Excellent, thank you so much. Next up is Peter Domenical, who is an oceanographer and also a paleoclimatologist and president uh, and director of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. Um, again, another uh, Ocean Visions partner. So Peter, um, welcome. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on those questions of uh, the alignment of Woods Hole and Ocean Visions um, and how we can together advance ocean solutions. Great, Brad. And thank you for uh, inviting me to be a uh, part of this uh, group and uh, really these uh, distinguished panelists. Uh, yes, I was, um, when I first became aware of Ocean Visions, uh, it became immediately apparent to me that uh, you have landed on uh, really an essential challenge really to the entire um, uh, global ocean science community, which is you know, how can we uh, really adjust the way that we do our science, the way we train our students, the way we build the next workforce to uh, accelerate the really important work that uh, is urgently before us. And uh, so at the Oceanographic, um, this was uh, really just a, 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 fundamental, uh, a, a fundamental importance to, to us to be part of this effort. Um, and I found this such a great opportunity to collaborate with uh, such uh, other esteemed uh, institutions. Uh, for, for me, I just see this as an, uh, as an opportunity for the Oceanographic to invest in inclusive excellence. This is not only um, the disciplinary breadth that we need to weigh in on ocean solutions, but also building the diverse uh, workforce, the inclusive workforce that's needed to uh, advance ocean sciences for solutions um, that allows us to reflect the society we serve. Um, but really the cornerstone of, of what's exciting to me and, and the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution is this opportunity to really drive innovation. That is, how can we uh, support our scientists, provide them the the freedom and the opportunity to uh, accept risk and to tolerate failure and to really accelerate the thinking that's needed to uh, provide the answers that uh, we have to on such a short time scale. And then the last component of this to me that's so exciting is an opportunity to engage the world. And indeed, just last night, I was on a call with Taiwan, uh, building a relationship that very much is supportive 
of what we're trying to do. Um, we're building relationships with industry. Some of you may have heard about the uh, deal we just signed with analog devices last week. Um, you know, this is really part of a way to kind of broaden the umbrella of engagement for ocean solutions. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, and last, but uh, certainly not least, is Susan Lodier, who uh, studies ocean circulation and the impact of ocean physics on marine ecosystems, but also serves as the Dean in the College of Sciences at Georgia Tech and president of the American Geophysical Union, who is uh, really one of our core partners here in putting the summit together. So welcome, Susan. Yeah, thank you, Brad. Um, as the others have mentioned, I'm very excited to be here. Um, looking forward to the next few days and uh, certainly uh, learning a lot. Um, Georgia Tech as a large public university is really committed you know, to serving the state and the nation and certainly bringing to bear you know, science, engineering, and technology to solve 21st century solutions. So for that you know, reason alone, um, Georgia Tech, particularly the College of Sciences, is very interested you know, in fully participating you know, as a partner um, in Ocean Visions. When I um, think about what's going on with Ocean Visions, I'm, you know, thought about, you know, for centuries and certainly the past decades as well, that universities, of course, have focused, you know, on fundamental science and also have focused on solutions, but often have allowed sort of for that um, information to flow out sort of diffusively, you know, from the universities. And I think what Ocean Visions is doing is really changing the nature of that interaction completely, such that instead of that slow diffusion of information, you know, one-way information from the universities outside of those ivory towers, what Ocean Visions really is doing is really stirring, creating really strong mixing, two-way interactions. And I find that really exciting and really potentially transformative for us to really change the pace you know, of um, bringing solutions to bear, you know, for the challenges we find, you know, with the ocean. So that's particularly interesting to me and particularly interested in the College of Sciences at, um, at Georgia Tech. I also want to say as the president of AGU, AGU has a new strategic plan. For those of you that don't know, AGU has been a professional society um, for a hundred years, strongly focused on fundamental science. But the tagline of our new strategic plan is that we want to have science that is usable, or sorry, that is used, not just usable. And that really sums up uh, why um, AGU is partnering as well um, with Ocean Visions. Very interested in continuing to embrace discovery science, but also really focusing as well on solution science. So with our ability, with AGU's ability, you know, to be a convener um, of groups like this with our global reach, you know, with members and uh, now gaining partnerships across the world. AGU is very excited to partner uh, with Ocean Visions because we feel like it really strongly aligns with our strategic plan. And we feel like we have um, really a great opportunity in, in this partnership to bring people together globally around these very important issues. So delighted to be here. Thank you and looking forward to the next few days. Okay, thank you all for those great opening comments and, and insights. I want to pick up on a couple of themes um, uh, because I know we're all really committed to this concept of moving really good ideas from wherever they might be from the idea phase into, into practice and into development. And I think within institutions that you represent, there are barriers. Or you referred to this a little bit um, you know, in your comments about these challenges of, of how do we get uh, how do we get staff and, and faculty and others really willing to take the risks to put solutions out into the world um, and to possibly fail, uh, which is something nobody likes to do? I, I'm wondering, I'd like to just hear uh, some of your thoughts on what we can do to encourage more of that risk taking uh, inside institutions. Are there, you know, are there particular or incentive structures that need to be changed, for example, in order to make um, more of a pipeline between academia and research institutions and, and solutions. And um, maybe I'll start with you, Peter, since you raised this, but I'd like to hear other thoughts on it as well. Great, thanks, Brad. Um, indeed, I think this is you know, one of the biggest obstacles to solutions. Um, you know, For those of us who are 
uh, from the uh, prior generation of ocean science. You know, the idea that all of a sudden your work is relevant and has this urgency to it really changes the nature of how you approach these kinds of problems. And yet we still need the very rigorous basic science that underpins as the foundation of all that we do. And so uh, here at the Oceanographic, you know, one of the uh, things that we're exploring now, actually we've just uh, announced what's called Vision 2030, which is the uh, institutional vision for the next decade, is really uh, an ownership of that uh, driving of innovation and willingness to pursue risk. And essentially um, a model that we've uh, landed on is being able to mobilize uh, new institutional resources to allow us to essentially uh, to own the personal risk that's attached to going after these difficult problems by actually funding scientists to pursue this and that pursuit of, of risky new ideas. So we do this as, a, as scientists, but we also do this and through other programs like the Keck Foundation, for example, that actually requires you to uh, pursue these uh, really transformative topics. And so one of the things that we found is that investing with this intention actually itself is its own reward, not only in advancing the field, but also we have you about a six to one return on investment for those, those kinds of uh, investments in staff. And I'll just conclude with that's um, how to sort of drive new ideas or a new idea boundary, if you will. But we also need to look on the other side, which is the staff, and to let them know that they're safe and that this is part of the promotion and uh, tenure criteria as well. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's a great segue. Um, uh, Susan, you know, from the academic side, what do you see as the incentives of, for for academics to really put themselves out there towards solutions? And what are the barriers to people who want to try to, to bridge the gap between academia and commercial uh, commercialization of ideas? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll pick up um, on just where, where Peter dropped off. But I think um, those of us in administration, you know, in across the universities need to really rethink um, what the criteria are for promotion and for tenure. You know, it's an incredibly conservative process um, right now, and it's been in place, you know, for, for many, many decades. And I often hear people say that until they get tenure, they're not willing to take those risks. And we don't want to do that because oftentimes, like what Margaret was saying, the students, the early career scientists are the ones that really carry a great deal of enthusiasm in this uh, solution space. So I think it's really important for us to collectively think about how we can start um, reframing uh, those promotion you know, and, and tenure uh, criteria. So it really is about, if we say we value this you know, at the universities, then we need to make sure that when we are promoting and tenuring people, that um, we hold true to those values. Now, it's, that is a tall order, right? And people have been talking about this for a while. But I think it's something that's really doable. Just like we said, the pace of change, Ocean Visions is changing that pace in terms of the interactions between you know, those within academia and without. I feel very optimistic um, that we can, we can make a difference here. That's great. Thank you. Karen, you know, from your perspective as somebody who's gone through um, the system, uh, do you feel like there are things that maybe we could change that would guide students on their career paths to, towards less focus on ever more sort of very detailed uh, uh, creation of novel um, information towards something more design focused as you put towards uh, solving problems? Do you have any ideas on that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a fabulous question and um, definitely one that I have my personal experiences and I'll share, but I am excited that we'll be exploring throughout this through the early career ocean professional conversations. So I'm hoping that those will also lend some more insight to kind of some of the unique experience of this specific community. But I think for me personally, it's been finding this community of people that have the same vision um, around sustainable solutions. I think that support structure and just, yeah, building those relationships actually for me has been at the core of kind of making me feel comfortable and able to navigate what feels like more of a, um, a journey uh, than a kind of a clear linear path. And so I think for me, that's definitely been central. And then I think 
another component of that is the relationship building and building trust. And for me, that's something that I think is especially important for folks early in their career, because these, I think a lot of these solutions will be long-term. And so it really requires that kind of more lasting understanding and also building this understanding of cultural differences. And I guess when I say that, I don't just mean from different regions or parts of the world, but also across these disciplines and sectors. Um, and so I think that, and then coupled with, as, as we've been mentioning, this valuation. So really valuing the kind of participation of people. So whether they be researchers, practitioners, or community members, so that kind of the metrics of success actually measure this, the kind of diverse skill set that it actually requires. So kind of community, communication skills, community relationship thing, maybe policy oriented writing and kind of this open-minded and team-centered approach that I think is often needed for this collaboration. So yeah, I'm really excited to kind of keep building this community and seeing what some of the opportunities uh, and barriers are that we face. So yeah, yeah thanks. Thank, thank you, that was, that was great. I think really good insights. And Margaret, Scripps is sort of already in this space, as, as I know the other institutions are as well. You have a, a Start Blue Accelerator that you've just recently launched. You do have uh, pathways to commercialization um, for people inside the institution. What are some of the lessons that you might bring in, in how we can do more of this and make it easier uh, for, you know, for, for academics and researchers to really be playing in the space of commercial solutions? Well, uh, thanks, Brad. Um, I, I think some of the lessons that we've learned are uh, first, how important it is to be able to connect those who have uh, ideas about uh, new developments that, that they want to commercialize, that they want to form startup companies for, to connect them with people who have great expertise in that area. So we have entrepreneurs and residents uh, at the campus that can help our, um, our researchers uh, understand not you know, their particular specialty or their product, but how uh, the trajectory is going to look as a startup, uh, what they need to do, where the resources are for them to do that. We, we also are fortunate in San Diego to have uh, a great group called Clean Tech uh, that is a, a connector organization, and it takes on startups and uh, mentors them and connects them with other companies with resources uh, of, uh, of various sorts, not just venture capitalists, but uh, other very early stage investment sources. So I think one of the things that that we need to do and think about is is what ecosystem we create for those people that are trying to be innovators. Uh, a second comment that I'd like to make uh, is around this subject of, of failure and how we look at failure. And you know, one of our most uh, distinguished oceanographers, the late Walter Monk, used to really um, bemoan the fact that we never published anything about experiments that didn't work or uh, ideas that didn't pan out. And uh, it's such, uh, you know, it, it's like a, uh, I don't know, it's like a family member, you know, that nobody wants to talk about. Uh, oh, you know, this happened and, and, uh, and we really should. And the reason is uh, that Number one, all of those early career people are out there. They don't, you know, they haven't been to uh, have a beer at AGU where everybody said, oh yeah, this didn't work. Uh, and so they're out there thinking about these ideas and, uh, uh, and in danger of recreating these, uh, these paths that, that weren't profitable or weren't successful. The second thing is that uh, it's a lot of work that people have done that they get no credit for. Uh, you know, it's like you, you work and work and work and, and nobody uh, says, oh, you should have a publication or get something in your, your record unless 
you know, it's a wild success. So we're right. ignoring all of this work. Right. Uh, and the third is that I think that there's also a lot of talk about, uh, you know, sort of the wisdom of, uh, you know, of, of uh, senior people in the field and they say, oh, that won't work, you know, like everybody knows that you can't do that or everybody knows that that's not the way it is. Uh, but it's, it may be grounded only on their, um, you know, on their particular perspective. If we encourage the, uh, the revelation of all of that, then there's a record of does it work or doesn't it work? Uh, you know, I'd rather not take Margaret Lyman's opinion about whether something is a, a good idea or whether it works or not, but see that um, that revealed in the literature. That was great. Thank you so much. I'm really sorry to say that we are at time. This was a very short amount of time, and I think we could go on about this for quite some time. And I hope that this is an opening uh, uh, salvo to really have this conversation over the next four days, because this is at the core. How do we rapidly uh, turn and shift towards much more focus on solving these most dangerous and challenging problems that we face? And so I thank all of you for participating. And there's been a, a sixth face on the screen here. Um, uh, of our esteemed founding chairman, Emanuele Di Lorenzo, who really deserves enormous credit of, along with others, but a lion's share of enormous credit for pulling all of this together. And I now wanna turn it to him for some concluding remarks. Hello, my name is Emanuele Di Lorenzo and I serve as the founding chairman of Ocean Visions. I'm also a professor and director of the program in Ocean Science and Engineering at the Georgia Institute of Technology. Welcome to the second Ocean Vision Summit, which is devoted towards developing a global ecosystem for ocean solutions in support of the United Nation Decade for Ocean Sustainable Development. And a thank you to the UN Decade Committee for formally endorsing this summit. One of the goals of Ocean Visions is to connect the ocean solution science and engineering community to the growing landscape of ocean professionals, innovators, investors, leaders, and decision makers to solve the big problems, which require a more systemic approach for equitable and scalable ocean solutions. I'm glad to report that this year we have over 2,000 confirmed participants from 75 countries that reflect a truly multi-sector community as shown in the pie graph below including 650 early career ocean professionals, also known as ECOPS, who have actively engaged in co-planning and organizing the summit across all time zones. You will find several ECOP hosted events throughout this week. Following our mission of inclusivity and equitable access, the summit has been intentionally co-organized with five virtual campuses located across four continents in Europe, Africa, Oceania, and the Americas, with the help of our international partners who are listed below. I also want to give a special thanks to all those who have worked hard in the organization of this complex event. First, a recognition to the ECOP members of the organizing committee, who have truly transformed the reach and participation of the summit. Delphine Lobel, Kelly Switch, Theo Bongartz, Louise Gamage, Aaron Sarewhite, Valeria Komyakova, and Daniel Kleinman. Second, I want to acknowledge the other senior organizers, specifically Fiorenza Micheli, also co-chair of Ocean Visions, and some of the members of the Ocean Vision leadership team, Gwen Nero, Mark Merrifield, Anna Zivian, Millie Pitts, and Chuck Green. A thank you also to our partners from Australia with Greta Peckel, Karen Evans, and Mary Fudge, and from the Africa and Europe team with Cordula Zenk, Corinne Almeida, and Alexis Groskov and please forgive me if I have missed anyone. A special acknowledgement goes to the Ocean Vision staff, Brad Ack, Executive Director, David Kowick, Science Director, and Jessica Keith, Communication Director, and also to the institutions that make up the Ocean Visions for their engagement, leadership, and funding support. I would like to single out the American Geophysical Union and their A-team Victoria, Nicole, Heather, Amy, and Mark who have partnered with Ocean Visions to implement the summit. And finally, a special thanks to our partners and main funders, the Grantham Environmental Trust, Climate Work Foundation, Smith Marine Technology Partners, the George Aquarium, and the Builder Initiative. Thank you for sharing and supporting the Ocean Vision mission and approach. I wish everyone a productive Ocean Vision week, 
and thank you for participating. All right, thank you everybody. And I believe uh, session one will be starting in about 10 minutes for those of you interested on ocean-based carbon dioxide removal. Again, thanks to all of you for participating this morning and I look forward to our continued collaboration.